Mort d'Arthur by Alfred Lorne Tennyson. So all day long the noise of battle rolled among the mountains by the winter sea until King Arthur's table, man by man, had fallen in lioness about their lord. King Arthur, then because his wound was deep, the bold Sir Bedivere uplifted him. Sir Bedivere, the last of all his knights, and bore him to a chapel nigh the field, a broken chancel with a broken cross that stood on a dark strait of barren land. On one side lay the ocean, and on one lay a great water, and the moon was full. Then spake King Arthur to Sir Bedivere, the sequel of today unsolders all of the goodliest fellowship of famous knights, whereof this world holds record. Such a sleep they sleep, the men I loved. I think that we shall never more, at any future time, delight our souls with talk of knightly deeds, walking about the gardens and the halls of Camelot, as in the days that were. I perish by this people which I made, though Merlin swear that I should come again, to rule once more. But let what will be, be. I am so deeply smitten through the helm that without help I cannot last till morn. Thou therefore take my brand Excalibur, which was my pride. For thou rememberest how in those old days, when summer noon, an arm rose up from out the bosom of the lake, clothed in white samite, mystic, wonderful, holding the sword, and how I rode across and took it, and have worn it like a king. And wheresoever I am sung or told in aftertime, this also shall be known. But now delay not. Take Excalibur, and fling him far into the middle mare. Watch what thou seest, and lightly bring me word. To him replied the bold Sir Bedivere, It is not meet, Sir King, to leave thee thus aidless, alone, and smitten through the helm. A little thing may harm a wounded man. Yet I thy hest will perform at full. Watch what I see, and lightly bring thee word. So saying, from the ruined shrine he stepped, and had moon athwart the place of tombs, where lay the mighty bones of ancient men, old knights, and over them the sea wind sang, shrill, chill with flakes of foam, he, stepping down by zigzag paths and juts of pointed rock, came on the shining levels of the lake. There drew he forth the brand Excalibur, and o'er him drawing it the winter moon. Brightening the skirts of a long cloud, ran forth and sparkled keen with frost against the hilt. For all the half twinkled with diamond sparks, myriads of topaz lights, and jacinth work of subtlest jewelry. He gazed so long that both his eyes were dazzled as he stood, this way and that dividing the swift mind in act to throw. But at the last it seemed better to leave Excalibur concealed there in the many knotted water flags that whistled stiff and dry about the marge. So strode he back slow to the wounded king. Then spake King Arthur to Sir Bedivere, Hast thou performed my mission which I gave? What is it thou hast seen, or what hast heard? And answer made the bold Sir Bedivere. I heard the ripple washing in the reeds, and the wild water lapping on the crag. To whom replied King Arthur, faint and pale, Thou hast betrayed thy nature in thy name, not rendering true answer as beseemed thy fealty, nor like a noble knight. For sure or sign had followed, either hand or voice, or else a motion of the mare. This is a shameful thing for men to lie. Yet now I charge thee, quickly go again, as thou art leaf and deer, and do the thing I bade thee. Watch, and lightly bring me word. Then went Sir Bedivere the second time across the ridge, and paced beside the mare, counting the dewy pebbles fixed in thought. But when he saw the wonder of the hilt, how curiously and strangely chased, he smote his palms together, and he cried aloud, And if indeed I cast the brand away, surely a precious thing, one worthy note, should thus be lost forever from the earth, which might have pleased the eyes of many men. What good should follow this, 
if this were done? What harm undone? Deep harm to disobey, seeing obedience is the bond of rule. Were it well to obey, then, if a king demand an act unprofitable against himself? The king is sick and knows not what he does. What record or what relic of my lord should be to after time but empty breath and rumors of a doubt? But were this kept, stored in some treasure house of mighty kings, someone might show it at a joust of arms, saying, King Arthur's sword, Excalibur, wrought by the lonely maiden of the lake. Nine years she wrought it, sitting in the deeps upon the hidden bases of the hills. So might some old man speak in the aftertime to all the people, winning reverence. But now, much honor and much fame were lost. So spake he, clouded with his own conceit, and hid Excalibur the second time, and so strode back slow to the wounded king. Then spoke King Arthur, breathing heavily, What is it thou hast seen, or what hast heard? And the answer made the bold Sir Bedivere, I heard the water lapping on the crag, and the long ripple washing in the reeds. To whom replied King Arthur in much wrath, O oh, miserable and unkind, untrue, unknightly, traitor-hearted, woe is me. Authority forgets a dying king, laid widowed of the power in his eye that bowed the will. I see thee what thou art, for thou, the latest left of all my knights, in whom should meet the offices of all, thou wouldst betray me for the precious hilt, either from lust of gold, or like a girl valuing the giddy pleasure of the eyes. Yet for a man may feel, fail in duty twice, and the third time may prosper, get thee hence. But if thou spare to fling Excalibur, I will arise and slay thee with my hands. Then quickly rose Sir Bedivere, and ran, and leaping down the ridges lightly, plunged among the bulrush beds, and clutched the sword, and strongly wheeled and threw it. The great brand made lightnings in the splendor of the moon, and flashing round and round, and whirled in an arch, shot like a streamer of the northern morn, seen where the moving isles of winter shot by night, with noises of the northern sea. So flashed and fell the brand Excalibur. But ere he dipped the surface rose an arm clothed in white samite, mystic, wonderful, and caught him by the hilt, and brandished him three times, and drew him under in the mare, and lightly went the other to the king. Then spoke King Arthur, drawing thicker breath, Now I see by thine eyes that this is done. Speak out, what is it thou hast heard or seen? An answer made the bold Sir Bedivere, Sir King, I close mine eyelids, lest the gems should blind my purpose, for I never saw, nor shall see, here or elsewhere till I die, not though I lived three lives of Lord mortal men, so great a miracle as yonder hilt. Then with both hands I flung him, wheeling him. But when I looked again, behold an arm, clothed in white samite, mystic, wonderful, that caught him by the hilt, and brandished him three times, and drew him under in the mare. An answer made King Arthur breathing hard. My end draws nigh. It is time that I were gone. Make broad thy shoulders to receive my weight, and bear me to the margin. Yet I fear my wound hath taken cold, and I shall die. So saying, from the pavement he half rose, slowly with pain reclining on his arm, and looking wistfully with wide blue eyes as in a picture. Him Sir Bedivere remorsefully regarded through his tears, and would have spoken, but he found not words. Then took with care, and kneeling on one knee, or both his shoulders drew the languid hands, and rising, bore him through the place of tombs. But as he walked, King Arthur panted hard, like one that feels a nightmare on his bed when all the house is mute. So sighed the king, muttering and murmuring at his ear, Quick, quick, I fear it is too late, and I shall die. But the other swiftly strode from ridge to ridge, clothed with his breath, and looking as he walked larger than human on the frozen hills. He heard the deep behind him, and a cry before. 
His own thought drove him like a goad. Tri clashed in his harness in the icy caves and barren chasms, and all to left and right the bare black cliff clanged around him as he based his feet on juts of slippery crag that rang sharp smitten with the dint of armed heels. And on a sudden, lo, the level lake and the long glories of the winter moon. Then saw they how there hove a dusky barge, dark as a funeral scarf from stem to stern beneath them. And descending, they were ware that all the decks were dense with stately forms, black stoled, black hooded, like a dream. By these three queens with crowns of gold, and from them rose a cry that shivered to the tingling stars. And as it were one voice, an agony of lamentation, like a wind that shrills all night in a wasteland where no one comes or hath come since the making of the world. Then murmured Arthur, place me in the barge. And to the barge they came. There those three queens put forth their hands and took the king and wept. But she that rose, the tallest of them all and fairest, laid his head upon her lap and loosed the shattered cask and chafed his hands and called him by his name, complaining loud and dropping bitter tears against his brow, striped with dark blood. For all his face was white and colorless, and like the withered moon, smote by the fresh beam of the springing east. And all his greaves and cusses dashed with drops of onset, and the light and lustrous curls that made his forehead like a rising sun, high from the day throne, were parched with dust or clotted into points and hanging loose, mixed with the nightly growth that fringed his lips. So like a shattered column lay the king, not like that Arthur, who with lance and rest, from spur to plume a star of tournament, shot through the lists at Camelot, and charged before the eyes of ladies and of kings. Then loudly cried the bold Sir Bedivere, Ah, my lord Arthur, whither shall I go? Where shall I hide my forehead and my eyes? For now I see the true old times are dead, when every morning brought a noble chance, and every chance brought out a noble night. Such times have been not since the light that led the holy elders with the gift of myrrh. But now the whole round table is dissolved, which was an image of the mighty world. And I, the last, go forth companionless, and the days darken round me, and the years, among new men, strange faces, other minds. And slowly answered Arthur from the barge, The old order changeth, yielding place to new, and God fulfills himself in many ways, lest one good custom should corrupt the world. Comfort thyself. What comfort is in me? I have lived my life, and that which I have done may he within himself make pure. But thou, if thou shouldst never see my face again, Pray for my soul. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Wherefore, let thy voice rise like a fountain for me night and day. For what are men better than sheep or goats that nourish a blind life within the brain? If, knowing God, they lift not hands of prayer, both for themselves and those who call them friend. For so the whole round earth is every way bound by gold chains about the feet of God. But now, farewell. I am going a long way with these thou seest, if indeed I go. For all my mind is clouded with a doubt, to the island valley of Avalon, where falls not hail, or rain, or any snow, nor ever wind blows loudly. But it lies deep meadowed, happy, fair with orchard lawns and bowery hollows, crowned with the summer sea, where I will heal me of my grievous wound. So said he, and the barge with oar and sail moved from the brink like some full-breasted swan that fluting a wild carol ere her death ruffles her pure cold plume and takes the flood with swarthy webs. Long stood Sir Bedivere revolving many memories till the hull looked at one black dot against the verge of dawn and on the mare the wailing died away. <laughs>